went with him. It was uh, it was an amazing show. It's called Egypt Live. Uh, anyway, so they they go down, 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 meters upon meters down into the earth and unveil Osiris's tomb. And this should be a major story for people that are going, wait a minute, wasn't Osiris a god? And what does this mean? And they had to pump all the water out of there and pull this up, and they found an entire subterranean complex under the Giza Plateau, which now they're investigating. So we have all of that, but it's being completely covered up. There's a dig going on under the Sphinx at this moment, being covered up, people's lives at risk that are trying to report it. There's a lot going on. They, they eventually changed the name of the Osiris tomb to the Osiris shaft. And I kind of giggle because, you know, all of these obelisks that you see around are actually Osiris's phallus or Osiris's shaft. Uh, <laughs> so when you look into it now, it won't be called the tomb of Osiris. On top of that, they just announced that they had found the, uh, the lost tomb of King Gilgamesh. Now, that one should have been very curious. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't find any further reports on this. Now, it was absolutely identified that they had found this lost town or city of Ur, and in there they'd found King uh, Gingl Gilgamesh, and you realize now Gilgamesh was a Nephilim. He was a giant. He was two-thirds god, according to him in his book, and saying that his mother was a goddess and his father was human. And that he tried to get off planet Earth. He went around to all of the major temples or the housings of the gods where he ran into things like flaming uh, swords and, and, and strongly barricaded doors. The gods never let him in. But he was a, a giant, you know? And so now here we are in the 21st century announcing that we found his tomb. And everyone just goes, oh... Yeah, well, th yeah. that might actually bring some validity to all these Sumerian tablets and this this alternative history, and it might just blow away the whole power structure of religion. I think the powers that be thought they had a handle on everything until archaeology came around, and then the Internet came around and made things even harder for them because we're finding out things and, and sharing this information with each other. They don't have nearly as much control over it as they used to. So but to be honest, that's what I'd like to talk with you guys today. Max and I are a little out of it today because we had the big presentation yesterday. Oh. Uh, we even had the, the Bunjala high priest or custodian come and bless the, uh, the talk we gave here. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, nice. it, was, it was quite amazing. Uh, I already have pictures of him at the, the talk up on my website on the blog. Uh, it was, it was in incredible. And so we're both in kind of a mystic state today. And uh, really, what's, what's on our focus is, is the solutions that are coming up. And when you brought up the Internet, it really made me think of what Max is doing here in the collection they're trying to pull together. Because here we are, if we consider what has happened with the Internet, I'm standing here in Australia right now because of the Internet. And so we got to understand the magic behind this tool that we have and that it can be very useful in uniting our power. And I don't mean that in some sort of attacking way, but the fact that we can share amongst each other, that we can get on this Internet and realize that there's humans all over planet Earth that are identical to us, and that there really is no difference, and that all the conflict and strife comes from governments, nations, and we start to realize just how much we are all alike. I mean, I've come here all over Australia, and there's people I know that seem just like people in Kansas. I went to uh, one of Max's meetings and uh, started telling them about how I felt this was a part of my destiny, as it was when I went to the temple, the Pyramid of Tikal, and performed the Mayan ritual for the winter solstice. When they said that they had gathered a tribe of nations through prophecy, and we had showed up. And they told us that we were gathered here because it's time for the peoples of the world to unite. And they were no longer going to hold their Mayan rituals to their own selves and share with the world. So they brought us all there. And in that unity, I found the understanding of gratitude and the understanding of ceremony. And then I come up here to Australia and I find a very similar thing going, only this is now more... Uh, community-oriented, trying to get the, the major gardens going, permaculture, uh, community sharing, and all of this going on. And I told them how I felt this was a part of my destiny, just as the Mayans seemed to be part of my destiny. And a girl walks into the room, and she says, Freeman? <laughs> 
it was the very girl from the Mayan ritual that I had just been talking about who led Jeff down the road from where this meeting was and was now a co- part of this collection here as well. Ah, synchronicity. Wow. Mm-hmm. Let, me, a- let me ask you this, though, Freeman. Um, I, I, I speak a lot about the same things that you talk about on other radio shows, and when we have Christians in the conversation, they always jump up and yell, blasphemy, one people, that's blasphemy, that's new world order, that's new age. What would you say to that mentality? That's mind programming. That's mind control you're spitting out. Uh, We've gotten a lot of that lately. Well, you know what's I was in a discussion with somebody the other day, and I was saying, you know, we all need to love each other, one consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. He actually said, shut this hateful effort up. (laughs) As I was saying the word love. Yeah. Completely backwards. Yeah. We actually opened the show with a bit of a sermon and an explanation of Jesus' beliefs of magic and synchronicity. And how he told all of the Christians to go perform these miracles, to heal the sick, to, to raise the dead, to go out and be as a child, be as a fool. And then you know God and you will be beloved. All of these things have been written in the Bible if you show it to him. If you show him uh, having his uh, apostles walk on water and then they fall in and he says, oh, ye of little faith. You know, we need to be the miraculous ones. And so if the Christians can't read their own Bible without only looking at the nefarious ends, without only seeking the satanic version of the Bible, you could start to look at the miraculous version. Uh, like all of that. this is in there. I like that, the satanic version of the Bible. That's, that's beautiful <laughs> because that's what a lot of these people come off to me as. Yeah, uh, they're, they're, I'm, I'm a Christian personally, but I'm not that kind of Christian that, that thinks that it's not okay for other people to have theories or ideas or, um, and it's why people are so drawn away from that culture because reality is what they say it is and it's not okay to question it or have ideas about it even when what you're taught flies in the face of, of science and logic that we've learned over the years. I mean, it's like, nope, the world's flat, mm-hmm. you know? Max, how do we wake people up from this religious programming? Oh, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it, Chris? It is. It is. But you're the million-dollar man, so I know you have the answer. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's all sorts of religions as well. I mean, there's been a lot of things that have been devised to lead them away from, from being woken up and, and give them uh, the perspective that they have been woken up, like the New Age movement, for example. I mean, I've probably just made a lot of enemies by saying that. but um, <laughs> No, the, not at all. The New Age movement really is it's just another religion. It's, it's all, um, it gives people 95% of the truth and then it wraps them up in ego and keeps them in a state of inaction. Yeah, they're so busy hugging a tree that they don't realize that their country is being invaded or that their mind is being invaded. Well, the thing is, it's all about love and light and they're saying, oh, I can't focus on any negative. I have to just focus on the positive. But what they're doing is they're allowing all this negative stuff to go on in the world. They're basically putting themselves in a state of denial and, and thinking that they're doing the right thing by not looking at anything that's going on around them. It's, uh, it's very frustrating. And they're some of the hardest people to get to because many of them are very wrapped up in ego. They get to a certain stage and then they get convinced that they are somehow enlightened and they're just not, not prepared to look any further. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming up to another break. Uh, Max Egan and Freeman are our incredible guests for the evening. And we'll be right back. TruthFrequencyRadio.com is our website. And, of course, the networks, American Freedom and Polygraph. We'll see you on the other side. And we are back. TruthFrequencyRadio.com is the website. And our amazing guests, of course, Freeman and Max Egan. And uh, before the break, we were talking about the New Age movement and the positive thinking and um, how the New Age movement is kind of hijacked into positive thinking and ignoring the negative. But let me ask you this, though, Max. Don't we create our reality? And, I mean, even in the very basic sense, we think about something, and then we do it, and then the outcome is our reality. I mean, does that is that valid at all? Well, it is, but um, if you look at this, be the change that you wish to see in the world, and that's a, a very great thing to do, be the change that you wish to see in the world, as said Gandhi. Well, I can be in a state of positive energy, and I can be that sort of a thing, but... 
if I'm simply in a state of positive energy and I'm sitting there in a little little bubble of my own reality and I'm ignoring all of the things that are going on, all the negative things that are happening to my brothers and sisters all around the world, then what I, the change that I am being is a state of denial, basically. I mean, I can look at all of the things that are going on and I can have empathy for the victims in these situations, but I can hold... I can do it with no animosity towards the attackers, to, towards the perpetrators of these crimes. I don't hate the people that carry out these crimes. I feel that they need healing more than they need hurting. But I can't ignore the actions that they're doing. I can't ignore the crimes that they are perpetrating against other people. Um, if I was to do so, well, I would, it would simply be silent acquiescence. It would be acquiescence to, to the, the crimes that they're committing by my um, refusal to participate, by my my um, denial of these crimes or my failure to address these crimes. I think that, we, sure, we have shadows within ourselves, but we also have a collective shadow in the world. And I believe that if people would eliminate fear from their lives and eliminate fear from their perceptions, we could collectively turn to face this shadow. I think we could heal it very quickly. Well, I completely, so, yeah, I completely agree with that. But it's hard, though, to not fall into that negativity and be overwhelmed by that negativity. I mean, I was there myself. I was looking at everything that was happening, the, the BP oil spill, everything that's going around, you know, in Iraq, all the wars, all the people dying. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? Humans are just terrible, terrible creatures. And it wasn't until Freeman did an incredible speech on our broadcast that it really opened my eyes. But how, how do people keep from getting just sucked into all that negativity? Well, what I try to explain is, is to understand energy. If you understand how energy works and you understand that um, everything that exists is simply energy condensed into matter, and this energy has two polarities, you know, um, good and bad, light and dark, positive, negative, whatever you want to call it. But this energy manifests within the human experience as the two emotional extremes of love and fear. So if you can understand that everything, all emotions that you, you have come from those two base emotions... And often you might be angry because of love, because of empathy. Often you might be angry because of fear. But if you can look at all of this information and all of this stuff as just information and put yourself in a negative, in a, uh, I mean, a, a neutral energetic state, I believe you can look at things very differently. Now, this is what I sort of refer to as being in a state of unconditional love. If, if people can understand what unconditional love is, it's simply a lack of fear. That's all love actually is. Love is an energetic state. People tend to anthropomorphize love. They give it human qualities. They think of the love I have for a woman or a dog or, or a meal or a piece of music or whatever. But on a deeper level, it's actually an energetic state. So if you can remove fear from your life, well, then you're in a state of love, aren't you? And if you're in a state of love, you'll find that you can look at the perpetrators of these crimes and you can love them just as much as the victims of these crimes and realize that they're only carrying out these acts because they don't understand what reality is. They, they have a, uh, a distorted view of reality and you can't blame them for it because they are a product of this world that we have collectively created. And that's the way I, I tend to look at all of this stuff. And also when you look at stuff on an energetic level, if you realize that um, um, everything, everything happens for a reason, all of the negative stuff that's going on in the world is what is helping this consciousness become more aware and more active and, and more positive. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So I might look at a, a, a child being blown up in Gaza and think how terrible that is. But if I was to look at it more holistically, I could also imagine that that child, the spirit that is that child, possibly came and chose to be blown up right there on television for me to see, to wake me up to the fact that this is going on in the world and give me the opportunity to address these problems. I see all these problems as opportunities. And that's just the way I, I tend to look at this sort of stuff, and that, that helps me um, perceive it from a different light. Well, um, I, I've, it works anyway. I've heard of that before. I've heard of that, that we actually choose our life and we choose the experiences. And some people choose to be mass murderers so they can get that experience and, and live their whole life in prison. Other people choose to have other experiences before they even come into this plane. Um, that's you, Like you choose who your parents are yeah, going to be, yeah. and you choose whether you're going to be born in a in a liberal kind of democratic house where you know everybody's not real religious or you choose to be raised in a fundamentalist christian pentecostal household and and have to go to yeah, but, private schools you know 
if you look at it even more holistically, what, what if you choose to come here to be the, the unique frequency that you are in this collective reality?